So thank you everyone for joining the Ashley Illinois chapters webinar on notification and heating and decarbonization um, with Seth Sanborn. Um, as was alluded to before, I am the sustainability chair uh, for the Ashley Illinois chapter. This is actually our first year of ever existing. Um, and so we are kind of trying to figure out uh, really what our kind of roadmap is for the committee. Um, obviously the main focus would be sustainability um, and what it means for indus our, our industry and um, for our region. We've been fortunate enough that we have been invited on at least one major initiative with the city of Chicago and their decarbonization net zero initiatives. Um, this is a group of many different organizations between AIA and BOMA, Illinois Green Alliance, um, and a lot of nonprofits as well, um, just trying to help develop what um, these initiatives mean here in Chicago. If you're interested in joining the committee, um, interested in being you know, a stakeholder, um, please email me at sustainability at illinoisashray.org. Um, but I think that's a really great kind of platform for what we're talking about here today to kind of go into what's going across the US with this. Um, there's a lot of buzzwords, a lot of questions, a lot of policies coming out revolving around notification decarbonization. So we'll hopefully get a, a lot more educated um, here. So quick introduction for our uh, wonderful and est highly esteemed uh, presenter. Stet um, is a uh, mechanical engineer uh, from Kettering, who attended Kettering University and got a master's of architecture from University of California, Berkeley. Uh, Stet serves as our as a principal and engineering discipline leader at Smith Group San Francisco office. He specializes in net zero energy and net zero carbon design. He is the leading voice in a statewide decarbonization effort and building electrification. Now recently supporting new electric, um, new all electric building code developments in San Francisco, San Jose and Berkeley, and currently sits on the San Francisco mayor's task force for decarbonization. That leads efforts and incorporate to incorporate high performance building enclosures, passive design strategies, and advanced HVAC systems into a wide range of building types um, in pursuit of rapid decarbonization. And so with that, that. Awesome, thank you. Um, and thank you, um, Ashford Chicago for having me. Um, before everyone shames me as just a, uh, a West Coast engineer, <laughs> um, I did grow up in rural Iowa. <laughs> um, and so I spent summers at my dad's house in the north suburbs of Chicago. So I know Chicago pretty well. Um, and I know that you guys got snow today because my brother still lives in the South Loop. <laughs> so I, I do have ties to Chicago. Um, but thank you, uh, everyone, for having me. Um, uh, feel free to use the chat throughout the, the talk. Um, and as I see, thing, see things pop up, I'll try to address them. But we'll also break in the middle. Um, and at the end, I should leave plenty of time for Q&A. Um, so today we're going to cover a couple things. Um, I'll give you kind of a state of what's going on in, um, in California, specifically around decarb or electrification, and then also address um, generally the West Coast. Um, and just because it's, uh, it's trends that we're starting to see out here um, over the last three years um, about, and then they're starting to um, move over to other portions of the country as well, um, Massachusetts, sort of East Coast um, regions as well. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. I'll talk about a little bit about the technology that's enabling the rapid change. Um, none of it should be completely new, uh, especially for you, you guys. Um, but I'll talk about why some of those uh, changes are happening now. Um, and then I'll jump into talking specifically about some changes or technology specific ideas around cold climates, uh, because that's usually the biggest pushback um, that we hear from the industry side is that's great for California. Um, it doesn't work here. Um, and I'll, I will remind everybody that um, where I am right now in California, I have three and a half feet of snow. So we do have portions of the state that see weather. Um, we're not all uh, living the dream on the beach in San Diego. Um, and then the last point I'll talk to is if we are going towards decarbonization electrification, how do we um, establish ideas around resilience? Um, and this is obviously really important around um, you know, uh, heating and cooling, especially as you guys are probably seeing uh, the rolling uh, blackouts uh, stretching from Omaha all the way down to uh, Texas. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, so for California, um, the, the change is really being driven from a state um, law standpoint. So our legislature actually um, by law and signed by our former Governor Brown um, mandated that our 
uh, electricity grid be carbon neutral by 2045, uh, which is 24 years from now. <laughs> um, and for uh, such a large state with such a large population, that's and by no means a small feat. Um, and then simultaneously to that, um, the governor issued an executive order um, moving the entire economy to carbon neutrality by 24, 2045. That's a little squishy and it's not a mandate uh, because it's only an executive order, but um, um, it is sort of pushing the state uh, very aggressively uh, to decarbonize. Um, it happens to work pretty well in California. Um, so uh, these are trends. Uh, the graph on the uh, lower left is actually looking at the last um, six years or so um, of our carbon em uh, emissions uh, per month, average emissions per month. And you can see sort of the top line um, is the sort of black line from 2014. And you can see as we're pushing all the way down to 2019, which is the last time this graph uh, was fully produced, um, is that we've nearly halved our emissions um, already. Uh, so this, um, and that's largely been driven by a huge influx of renewables onto our grid. The graph in the upper right sort of shows you what the, that renewable distribution, uh, that little um, circle chart, uh, it's almost entirely solar uh, for California. Although we do have a pretty significant chunk of wind power, it's nothing like you guys do in the Midwest and sort of Iowa, Minnesota, the Dakotas, um, and Texas, for example. Most of our renewable energy is, um, is solar uh, driven. And uh, even what's not shown in these graphs actually is all of the behind the meter uh, solar that's added as well. Uh, for us, it's uh, kind of a no-brainer for every project to have so, uh, solar. That produces some really interesting uh, challenges uh, for our grid. The, the chart on the lower right, um, if you see the sort of renewables green line, you'll see in the middle of the day it spikes up and then immediately drops off around 3 p.m. Um, to about 6 p.m. Almost all of that power generation disappears. And our peaker plants, uh, which are all almost entirely gas-fired um, combined cycle peaker plants, um, are rapidly uh, firing and um, are ramping up at a speed that they're all, almost physically incapable of doing. So our challenge is actually not a supply of uh, renewable energy. It's actually time of use, when we use power, um, and what challenges that poses for the grid. Now, to compare that for you folks in, in Illinois on the ComEd system, you guys are a kind of an interesting island within your um, ISO or independent service um, operator. Uh, you guys are actually tied to a um, East Coast uh, grid. And you have a huge chunk of carbon neutral uh, power uh, from your nuclear um, arsenal. And so where we have a equal renewables to natural gas, you guys actually have almost equal natural uh, nuclear to natural gas. So whereas I wanna use power during the day, you guys actually, if you're looking for carbon neutrality or sort of reducing your carbon footprint, are actually gonna be biased towards the nighttime production when that nuclear um, uh, load is covering your base load uh, and you know, and doesn't like to ramp. <laughs> so nuclear power hates ramping. It likes to sit there nice and steady. Um, and so uh, when your load does go down um, in nighttime hours, uh, covering your base load and sort of shifting load into nighttime use would give you guys sort of the biggest carbon bank for your buck if you were to electrify your systems. What we do on our projects is actually start to look at the hourly use of energy. Um, when uh, from the graph on the left from you know midnight to midnight and then January all the way through December, uh, what hours are we using energy and what's the carbon emissions for that hour? So we call that our marginal emissions rate, um, sort of what the additional carbon associated with using power for that hour. And uh, the image on the left is when we compare using electric resistance uh, for say domestic hot water production or space heating compared to burning natural gas on site. Um, and that's with all the losses through the grid, uh, generation losses, distribution losses, um, transformer losses, et cetera. So in the image on the left, using electric resistance, I can still have uh, a lower carbon footprint um, essentially between um, 9 a.m. And, and say 2 p.m. or all the way up until maybe about 4 or 5 p.m. Uh, for several months a year, I can actually have lower emissions using electric resistance heat, which I would never promote. <laughs> I would say, don't do that. Um, and actually that's one of the issues that they're having in Texas right now is um, quite a bit of use of electric resistance heat. Um, you compare that graph on the left to the graph on the right. This is if I use a heat pump with a COP of about three, just under three. Uh, to do the same task, whether it's space heating uh, or uh, domestic hot water production or service uh, hot water. 
you'll see almost the entire graph switches to green. So there's almost um, less than 10% of the hours of a year will I have uh, more emissions if I use a heat pump on site using electricity with the grid compared to burning natural gas on site. And that's the nature of our grid in California. But it's, an, it's a number of states when we do this analysis in, along the West Coast in Seattle, uh, for instance, they have a significant amount of hydropower. Um, you guys have a significant amount of nuclear power. So your, uh, your graph is actually inverted uh, from mine. Uh, so in those hours that are red, you guys would actually be green. Um, in the midday when you're running your coal peaker plants, your coal plants plus your peaker gas plants, you'd actually have higher emissions midday. Um, so it matters looking at these graphs if we're trying to actually reduce carbon. So we don't want to just say electrify the system, you know, just use electric, electric resistance everywhere. We want to match the right technology to the right time of use uh, so that we actually result in lower carbon emissions. Now, why are we doing this? Um, well, out here in California, uh, there's been oh, several surveys where they've actually, you know, the, they've attached sensors onto the little Google map cars uh, that drive around to create your wonderful map experience and, and, um, and driverless directions. Well, they attached several methane sensors onto those cars and actually started mapping out um, methane leaks, natural gas leaks uh, throughout um, most of our large cities. So the example on here on the left is actually LA. And what they're realizing is the assumptions around leakage for the gas infrastructure have been remarkably um, underestimated uh, for the last 50 years, uh, where we were, they were assuming 1% leakage um, a year, maybe 2% were actually uh, through measurement and satellite uh, data, we're actually seeing that those uh, leakage rates are far higher, um, in excess of 6 to 7%, which means that it's not just the uh, carbon emissions associated with burning natural gas on site. We also have these fugitive emissions uh, where it's direct methane that's uncombusted, uh, which has a far higher greenhouse gas potential or global warming potential. That leakage rate is actually um, on par, the sort of uh, carbon uh, equivalent is on par to actually what we're combusting. And so that's driving a number of cities uh, to um, try to figure out how can we both decarbonize, transition off of combustion as a source of energy, but also how can we start trimming the tree back uh, from the infrastructure uh, in an equitable way? Uh, because if the infrastructure is still there, but only four people are using it, it's still leaking, it's still pressurized. And so how do you trim that tree um, without putting families at a disadvantage from a cost of uh, energy standpoint? Uh, the images on the right are actually false color uh, photography of a couple sites uh, here in Northern California uh, where they um, are actually looking at methane plumes. Uh, so this is uncombusted gas escaping from uh, some of the refinery uh, locations, which we have several refineries in Northern and Southern California um, uh, that receive uh, gas for processing or fuel, uh, uh, fuel oil for processing. And so in all these images, these are gas plumes um, that are uncombusted methane. So they pose both a explosion hazard, obviously, but also just a health hazard and environmental hazard. So this is sort of the infrastructure that as a state, we've decided that we want to move away from. Now that also has a huge impact on cost of utilities. Um, and this is something that we're working with almost all of our clients are to project out the cost of both electricity and gas uh, to help them make sort of the low risk decision. One of the things that we're realizing, or as a state we've realized, is that because of the rapid electrification of our new construction and cities trying to move folks off of natural gas, the, the people that are still on it and stay on that system are gonna end up carrying an undue burden of maintaining that infrastructure. So we talk about all those gas leaks uh, throughout the distribution system. Well, we have to fix those. We still have to maintain the system. We still have hundreds of thousands of miles of piping below, grain, uh, below grade that's uh, leaking and causing these fugitive emissions. And so a number of studies have gone uh, the, for the state uh, energy commission have been completed to sort of project out what will the cost per therm of gas be for those folks that stay on uh, the gas system while everybody else is migrating off. And unfortunately, uh, for those who stay on gas, they're projecting almost a fourfold increase in uh, gas costs by 2045. So right now in our state, we pay a little over a dollar per therm, uh, which is a little bit more. You guys pay like, I think, 80 cents a therm, 70 cents a therm, depending on um, what kind of customer you are. We pay like a dollar 14 a therm for a lot of commercial uh, clients. And they're projecting that's going to climb over $4. 
Um, so a pretty big, uh, it's definitely more than your 2% or 3% escalation that, we, that most of us have been used to carrying in our LCCA models. Um, and it's significant enough that it's posing a risk for our large portfolio clients. So they're asking us, how do I move off of uh, natural gas faster than what the state wants me to do? Because I don't want to expose that potential risk. So that's something that we're folding in uh, to our modeling. To give you a sense of how fast this is happening, um, as of last week, uh, there's almost, I think there's 45 cities in California that have already passed all electric building codes or all electric reach codes. And we have uh, kind of a weird code scenario in California where we have our state energy code, Title 24, Part 6, uh, which is for the whole state. But any city can actually pass a more aggressive code than the state building code. Um, and it is, um, and each of these cities sort of shown um, are, uh, modeling out um, cost effectiveness. They still have to pass it the three prong uh, structure for uh, state codes, but each of them has already passed all electric codes or all electric reach right, codes, so meaning that new construction that. in each of these jurisdictions, which happen to carry a huge portion of our population, um, are already uh, by code going to be all electric. Um, and there's already a number of cities, um, Berkeley being one of them, which was the first one to pass an all electric code, but they're actually looking at a retrofit code now of how to equitably retrofit their entire city off of natural gas. Um, a question popped in, uh, can we get a source for the uh, four times increase in gas prices? Absolutely. Um, there's a really great report out uh, by E3, uh, which was paid for um, uh, by the state and, um, and they ran a whole, a whole host of scenarios. So aggressive decarbonization, not so aggressive. How would they re uh, redistribute that cost uh, equitably? Um, and that fourfold, increase for commercial costs was sort of the most equitable uh, where residential ratepayers didn't have to pay a premium. If they don't reallocate those costs and residential ratepayers, I, I think uh, we're going to go up by almost a factor of eight uh, because they are predominantly the predominant use of natural gas in the state. So of those cities, um, and actually just this week, Sacramento um, started their uh, legislative uh, period looking at adding um, our state capital uh, to this growing list. But right now we're around 12% of our statewide population already lives in a city that has an all electric uh, building code, which is significant. Um, you know, 12% of California is probably um, more than several Western states combined. Um, the county I live in is, has more population than um, like Wyoming, for instance. So it's not a, it's not a small um, uh, chunk of uh, folks. Um, a lot of this has actually been paced uh, the progress has been based on a coalition. Um, I'm just one of the crazy people, but there are a, a number of uh, engineers, uh, architects, activists, uh, NRDC, Sierra Club, uh, environmental activists, but mostly parents um, have been showing up at City Hall uh, meetings to help get these um, uh, codes passed. Um, in my role, uh, sort of as an engineer, sort of consulting engineer, um, I'm mostly providing technical guidance to city councils that are asking about feasibility, like what building types might be excluded, uh, what systems uh, are appropriate for each climate zone. And then we often get pulled in as a technical service for developers um, and sort of outside commercial clients to help them make that transition. So in general, um, what we're seeing in the marketplace is a pretty um, big move uh, in system types. So um, for instance, in multifamily residential, we're seeing a, a move away from uh, sort of traditional four pipe systems or in unit furnaces, uh, moving towards uh, mini splits or VRF type systems um, in, in our climate zone. So all electric for heating and cooling, uh, combining sort of one appliance that can do both. Um, and at, for projects at scale, uh, we have, a number of uh, projects that are using uh, air to water heat pump uh, systems. So there are four pipe systems. Usually uh, the, the ones that we like to use are um, involve heat recovery. Uh, so true four pipe systems that can do simultaneous heating and cooling um, or bias, whichever load is the greatest and then still provides heat recovery. Now those systems for us uh, with our utility rates um, provide phenomenal performance for our clients. Now, most of, our most of our projects are coastal California, a little bit some in the inland uh, empire, sort of um, in, the, in the valley. Um, but these work really well uh, for our climate zones. Um, they tend to bottom out around 
you know, uh, you know, our temperatures on the coast uh, tend to bottom out around 30 degrees uh, Fahrenheit outside air temperature, um, and these do great at 30 and above. We do start to run into some defrost issues, and I'll I'll talk about that in a little bit. The biggest move uh, maker, um, oh, I should go back because one of the reasons that we see a lot of projects that are moving in this direction for um, air to water heat pumps, mini split VRF, is they're looking for one appliance that does both things. Um, they're looking for one set of equipment, they can buy it, um, and they can hot swap things out in the future um, as technology improves, um, rather than having a separate appliance um, or device that is for heating and then another one that's cooling. Uh, it can simplify our electrical connections um, and sort of coordination if we have one central um, set of things uh, that can do both. Um, and especially on, this, on the part of simultaneous heating and cooling, which a lot of our commercial clients certainly have. Uh, we have morning warm up, but we still have that core of the building of the IT closets that have significant cooling loads 24 seven. And so that ability to do heat recovery um, provides a huge financial benefit to our clientele. On the domestic hot water side, this is the area I will say that's um, received is changing the fastest uh, and the most. Uh, and it's what most of our technical committees out here um, are working on, are better design guides around domestic hot water. Um, so as we move off of condensing um, water heaters, uh, gas-fired water heaters, we're seeing a market shift uh, towards either um, sort of monoblock or um, single singular unit type uh, heat pumps that are use, either using indoor air or ducted to the outside. In our climate zone, ducting to the outside provides a great benefit um, for most of the year. Um, but in more humid areas, you might actually want to, uh, like the southeast of the US, you might actually want to duct these from inside air and get that benefit of dehumidification inside your unit as well. The middle unit are sort of these split type um, uh, project uh, water heaters. So you have an outdoor condensing unit, uh, indoor storage tank, um, and these use a hydronic connection between sort of the monoblock unit outside and the tank. Uh, these are available um, as CO2 heat pumps using CO2 as a refrigerant um, and also available sort of with more traditional refrigerants. Uh, the image on the right are some, are some big beefy air source heat pumps uh, with ducted outside air coming into them. Um, and these are uh, typically seen on some large scale multifamily projects with um, doing uh, centralized domestic hot water heating. And I'm going to talk quite a bit more about central water heating uh, towards the tail end uh, of the conversation, specifically looking at uh, some of the coordination issues and impacts around designing uh, with, um, with heat pumps for uh, domestic hot water. Now, the biggest challenge that we've seen are actually on projects of scale. Um, when we look at our, for instance, you know, Smith Group does uh, quite, a, quite a bit of healthcare work and uh, technical labs, uh, large scale labs. Um, it's not always possible uh, to immediately go all electric. Um, and it, it may be from a technology standpoint, there might not be a te not technology that's viable at that moment or cost um, competitive. So we usually talk about sort of three stages uh, of electrification or system design. Uh, the top one is sort of more of a business as usual case. They're using boilers, chillers, cooling towers, very sort of um, state of today. Uh, you know, you might use really good design, uh, design still around uh, mild supply water temperatures where you can, you know, um, only doing deep chiller, uh, deep temperature chilled water, like 42 to 44 degrees. If you actually need to do dehumidification, we're lucky enough that we don't. <laughs> Northern California, which I know <laughs> growing up in the Midwest, that's not, not, <laughs> not true for everybody. Um, but we talk about sort of moving from that, at least getting to a heat recovery chiller base, um, where trying to cover the majority of your load uh, through heat recovery chillers um, with uh, auxiliary boiler or chiller as needed, um, a traditional chiller as needed to cover sort of those peaks and valleys that don't cover within your simultaneous heating and cooling band. Now the larger scale projects, um, we, we have more and more of that simultaneous demand, um, especially when we start layering on different building types. If we have a campus where we have a lab plus an office, um, administrative wing, and maybe an educational classroom, those load prof profiles, when we stack them up, provide a really nice heat recovery um, opportunity. It's when we have all the same type of building and we're stacking all of them up together that we don't get as much um, overlap. We start to get a lot more asymmetry and you might be relying more on your boilers uh, or auxiliary chillers. Um, and then the final sort of step is trying to go fully all electric. And I'm working on a hospital right now 
uh, campus, um, and we're designing a new, um, I think, six-story, which isn't really a tower, but six-story um, bed tower. And we're going all electric uh, for that entire new campus. And we're going to be um, working. We're working on this central uh, plant uh, master plan right now. For those projects, we're obviously still looking at heat recovery uh, heat pumps, uh, heat recovery chiller um, section, heat recovery heat pumps, and either augmenting that with air source or water source heat pumps uh, to do the peaks and valleys. And that is really dependent on where our really quality source energy is, uh, whether it's at outgoing sewage, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, outside air temperatures. We want to find the best source uh, to get the best uh, uh, heat recovery potential. And then we are still augmenting those projects with really small uh, sort of targeted uh, boiler, um, gas-fired boilers. And that typically is around um, uh, the um, sterilization component. So what the, depending on what the throughput is um, and the steam demand for sterilization, that right now in both labs and um, in our healthcare work is still an area that we haven't um, done a great job of at cost electrifying. Um, you know, electric boilers, um, at least for us and our utility rate structure, uh, can't compete with gas um, because it's essentially electric resistance. So it's one for one. And we really need um, uh, a COP around three before a device, an electric device, can compete with gas from a utility standpoint uh, for us out here. But this is sort of the tiers that we talk about. Often these complex projects are landing in that middle one. They're trying to cover as much of their load as they can uh, with an electric all electric system and then augmenting it with a much reduced in size uh, gas fired system. Um, so one of the big challenges when we translate some of these ideas into cold climates, um, and we and I hear this a lot. Um, you know, I was um, over the last year and a half, I've been um, on the ASHRAE committee. It's been writing the new multifamily zero energy design guide, and as we are going through all the system recommendations for that, you know, we're still putting system recommendations in all the way to ASHRAE Climate Zone 7. Um, and so we had to make sure that there was a feasibility around that. And so a lot of the uh, sort of info I'm sharing is sort of coming out of the research um, that Dan Nall, who's in New York, uh, New York City, and I were doing to look at how does this technology translate to cold climates. As you guys probably uh, well know, um, if, you're, uh, if you're sizing uh, heat pump systems in cold climates, there's two things that are going to um, drastically impact both your selection um, and your performance. Right. Most air source heat pumps that are trying to produce heat, and that's where we, we typically run into challenges. We have uh, heat pumps and heat uh, chiller plus cooling towers that work really well in the summer. That technology is sort of known. It's this wintertime performance in cold climates that's especially challenging. And you guys well know that as the temperature outside falls, the coefficient of performance on that heat pump also is declining um, and can be declining to the point where it's not cost effective uh, to pick that equipment uh, because of the cost of energy. The other sort of heartache or trouble that we have with air source heat pumps and low ambient outside temp is that the actual um, uh, energy production of that unit is also dropping uh, with the outside air temperature typically. Um, and it's, and that peak sizing, if we're sizing that heat pump for wintertime uh, conditions, we're sizing for that near worst case um, outside air temperature. And so we're buying more heat pump than we really want to buy uh, because the performance under those out, uh, poor outside air conditions um, is, a, is you know, a fraction of what the full uh, unit capacity could be. And so oftentimes when we're looking at cost, you know, trying to combine two systems, if we just flat out said, oh, I'm going to buy an off-the-shelf air source heat pump and try to use that for um, space cooling or domestic hot water production, um, I'm going to end up buying way more than I really want to uh, from, from a cost standpoint. And it certainly isn't going to comp um, compare advan advantageously to a gas-fired boiler or water heater. Um, and so the strategies that we need to bring to bear for cold climates are really addressing these two factors. It's the coefficient of performance. How can we increase that? And how can we simultaneously increase um, the sort of production of that piece of equipment so that it's not going to um, suffer as much during those cold days? The, first, the two um, sort of driving technology changes that we see in uh, the sort of heat pump market for cold climates is first, almost universally, uh, the industry is moving to invert, inverter-driven compressors. Um, and 
um, which has benefits in non-cold climates as well. But the ability to actually match uh, the compressor uh, frequency and sort of effort of the compressor to, out, to the load and both outside air temperature is incredibly important uh, in order to maintain that coefficient of performance um, down into low ambient temperatures. Uh, the graph on the right is a, a DOE uh, cold climate study where they were looking at sort of standard compressors versus inverter driven compressors. And what they're essentially showing is that most of the sort of state of today uh, inverter driven compressors like mini split systems uh, on the residential scale up, up to VRF are able to actually do a pretty good job maintaining uh, COP and output uh, down to sort of that five degrees, zero degree uh, temperature before they have to boost on uh, into some of the electric resistance or backup uh, elements. And that's really important both for uh, us from a cost of energy standpoint or cost of the energy to heat uh, standpoint, but also being able to match load. And so we don't necessarily have to buy uh, as much heat, uh, uh, heat pump. The other big change that we see or big sort of benefit that we see for uh, heat pump systems in cold climates is actually ones that are, is relatively new. Um, and it's looking at using enhanced vapor injection. I don't want to sort of, well, actually, this is ASHRAE. So I gave this talk earlier to architects from the all glazed over, but this is ASHRAE, so I can, I can nerd out here a little bit. Um, so what you see in enhanced vapor injection, for those of you who haven't um, used heat pumps that have it, is that as that um, sort of hot refrigerant is coming off of um, our con uh, condenser coil, you know, it's, it's given up some of its heat, but it's still relatively warm. We can pull off a side, um, a sort of a side track of refrigerant and pass it through an electronic expansion valve and overheat exchanger to actually remove even more heat or sort of subcool that refrigerant. And the idea here is to subcool it before it goes through its expansion valve, uh, before it sort of is released and, and drops down in, in uh, temperature. So by removing even more uh, of that heat uh, first, we actually can subcool the uh, refrigerant before it goes into our evaporator. And this is really important for two reasons. One, um, as the outside ambient temperature is dropping, you know, that delta T uh, between the refrigerant and the outside air temperature is getting awfully close. And so in some circumstances, they're so close that you're not going to effectively get heat um, pulled out from the outside air. It's just not enough difference. Um, and so by subcooling that refrigerant, we're actually able to push that delta T farther apart by um, subcooling the refrigerant far below the outside ambient air temperature. So it still has room to actually pick up uh, energy before it goes back to uh, the compressor. The other reason why that's um, important besides that delta T um, is you're asking the, uh, the, the compressor to do less work. <laughs> um, so it's gonna imp improve your performance uh, of, of the system. So once that re refrigerant is able to pick up uh, that heat from outside, even though it's cold out, it goes into the compressor. And this is where the vapor injection uh, is really important. And so the uh, refrigerant that's coming off of my heat exchanger is actually going to be re-injected about midstream into, uh, into the compressor itself. And that heat that I sucked, the, that I pulled off of the refrigerant by subcooling it is actually acting to a certain extent as a form of compression and helping the compressor uh, heat up uh, that refrigerant before it goes back to uh, your condenser coil. So we see this as a really advantageous technology for cold climates. Um, and there's a couple of companies that are making these that are working in um, sort of climate, uh, ASHRAE climate zone seven, sort of northern, um, northern, northern tip of Minnesota, but also um, uh, good swaths of, of Canada. And they're working quite well with COPs, you know, north of two, um, two and a half. And then as the temperature comes up into what I would consider, you know, okay to be outside, uh, those COPs um, are, are fantastic. The whole discussion around source energy, though, becomes actually really important in cold climates. Like we, we typically are looking at air source heat pumps um, or ground source heat pumps. And all of you guys in the Midwest that actually have cooling and heating load know uh, the value of ground source heat pumps or geo exchange systems. Um, and the value that that has by um, dealing with a moderate temp sink source. Uh, your, your COPs are, are amazing. You might deal with it on the pumping energy side, uh, trying to pump. Um, all the fluid through uh, your bores. Um, but from a COP standpoint, at the heat pump itself, it does really well. Well, for us on the West Coast, our drilling costs are insane. We don't have uh, in the infrastructure, uh, manufacturing infrastructure, 
and construction infrastructure that does drilling. Uh, we don't have a lot of wells, um, and we uh, so it's just and we have a lot of rock <laughs> like right below the surface. And so geo exchange or ground source heat pumps for us are are non starter. Uh, we can barely get them to pencil out. Um, and so that pushes pushes us into an area of looking for a better source sink of energy uh, instead of the air. And on our multifamily projects, that sink is the sewer. <laughs> that's or that source of energy is the sewer water. Um, so we actually have a couple projects in design right now um, uh, with a company that uh, does sewer uh, heat pump mining, if you will, um, with a heat pump. So taking that uh, wastewater stream, uh, there's, a, there's a storage container where your sewer water comes in, it goes into this tank and it flows by gravity out. We're able to pump that water out, uh, which on a multifamily project is a beautiful like 70 degrees Fahrenheit wastewater stream. It's a, an amazing source if you're trying to use it to pull heat out of. We run that through a, a macerator, a heat exchanger, and a heat pump um, to produce domestic hot water. And the really nice thing about this is the two, the demand and the flow coming out of the building are um, happening at the same time. They're coincident. Um, and so there's a ton of value of taking that uh, source energy um, right at the time uh, it's available and then using that to um, create hot water and store it in tanks for use. And I'll show some sizing criteria uh, in a little bit to sort of walk you through what that scenario uh, uh, scenario looks like. The beauty of doing this though, and why it matters a lot is that coefficient of performance. You know, I was talking earlier about, you know, oh, we can see these um, air source heat pumps in, in cold climates and they might have a COP of two, maybe one and a half to two and a half um, during those cold outside air temps. When we look at a better source, whether it's ground source, sewage source, um, or energy recovery source, finding that really quality uh, place to pull energy from is dramatically going to push up our COP. And so this system that we're working with uh, that's doing uh, sewage heat extraction for domestic hot water production, we're seeing, uh, and we want to make 140 degree water uh, to store at, even then we're, we're seeing a COP of four and a half. And when we were doing all the um, parametric modeling as part of the ASHRAE multifamily energy design or zero energy design guide, um, for almost, I think for climates four, five, six, and seven, the system came out on top from an efficiency standpoint versus all the other ones. But I highly recommend when that uh, ASHRAE um, manual comes out, it's a great resource for multifamily projects if you're looking for um, electrification and decarbonization. Although it, it wasn't really intended to start like that, but it ended up being mostly focused on, on, on decarb solutions. Now, before you say that's crazy, you should never, I can't believe you're doing that, using um, sewer water as a source energy. Um, it's not isolated just to um, domestic hot water systems. It can also be used as a really nice sink uh, for a six pipe heat recovery uh, modular heat pumps as well to provide space heating and cooling for, uh, for a building. Uh, so this particular project is a Smith Group project um, it is the DC water headquarters in Washington, DC. It's a commercial office or an administrative building. And it has the benefit of sitting over a large pumping station. <laughs> um, so in this case, there's no sewage tank uh, that we need to um, help balance those energy flows um, and storage of that source energy sink. It's actually on top of a pumping station. And so there's almost an unlimited source, if you will, of sink or source uh, on the sewage side. So here's a, a layout of that system. As you can see, it um, uh, provides hydronic heating, cooling uh, through a heat recovery chiller, heat, heat recovery, modular heat recovery heat pump, I think is to be, would be a little bit more accurate. Um, but then running uh, on that source side, when we're out of balance, when we don't have simultaneous heat, it's looking for that source. And that source is a heat exchanger um, going towards the uh, sanitary uh, pump inlet and outlet. So we're stealing sewer water and then pumping back out. This has a really nice benefit because of the consistency of that temperature. You can design around it. It's, it's sort of a really finite window of that source energy. And ironically, because that sewer water typically is closely associated with ground temperature, uh, we don't see a huge fluctuation throughout the year. Um, and it's actually a pretty quality source, both in cold conditions and hot, uh, hot outside air conditions. So in the wintertime, when it's really cold outside, that source is warmer than outside air temperature, so we get an improved COP. Right. And in the summertime, when the outside air temperature is hot and humid, 
we actually also see an improved performance because that source is actually now cooler than outside air temperature. So it actually works, uh, does a benefit in, in both, um, both stands. Now we, I hear a lot um, of, oh, well, that's great for your cute multifamily buildings. You know, fine, you can do a six story building with a sewage heat pump, heat recovery or some wackadoodle uh, heat pump system. Um, but we're also doing fully all electric labs as well. Um, so we have healthcare projects that are going all electric and we do a significant number of uh, research labs. The project on the right is the integrated, integrated genomics lab at Lawrence Berkeley Lab uh, in Berkeley, California. Um, and that project was a project that I worked on uh, prior to joining Smith Group, um, but it was already an all electric um, research lab. And uh, it's chemistry, uh, heavy chemistry. Um, and about the program is about 60% chemistry, 40% um, computational uh, lab. So more sort of office style uh, lab, but that project <clears throat> um, is all electric and it's a combination of sort of chilled beams um, and radiant uh, cooling on the, on the office side. But the, uh, the biggest hurdle on the lab projects is actually not the mechanical systems. It's actually the lab processes and whether you can get away from gas blunts and burners. Uh, so this project, uh, uh, we end up working with the researching staff to showcase a number of all electric um, process equipment uh, for within the lab setting uh, that didn't have to use gas. There are a couple of uh, stations that couldn't get away uh, without gas and so they have small butane um, sort of standalone uh, Bunsen burners. A big effort though on these projects is actually utilizing the waste heat that's coming out of the exhaust hoods. You know, you're moving a lot of air through research labs, um, you know, from four to 12 air changes, depending on the crazy stuff that they're, they're doing in there. And so a key component to working on these complex projects is actually looking at that exhaust air stream as that quality source. It's, it's of that level of quality as the sewage is leaving a multifamily project. You, know, you have beautiful 70 degree air leaving this project year round. And so our first, you know, traditionally we've always used runaround coils. We've now moved to actually using uh, six pipe water source um, heat pumps to actually uh, be able to do simultaneous heating and cooling using that exhaust air stream um, as our source, um, and, which is uh, really fun. The project on the left is actually right next door. It's our second. Uh, so the building on the right is already opened. It's functioning, uh, it's, it's working actually quite well. The uh, image on the left is um, a new lab that we just finished construction documents on and construction will be starting this summer. Um, and this is uh, BioEpic. So it's a biological research lab um, also at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Um, this project is also all electric uh, biological research lab um, and it's about a 50-50 split lab to, um, uh, to research uh, computational research uh, offices. On that project, we have actually far more requirements because of the type of research they're doing. So we have um, moderate temperature chilled water, low temperature chilled water, industrial hot water, domestic hot water. We have a special uh, research uh, water loop. And so we actually have, I think, six different temperatures moving through all this building and throughout the building. And in this case, it's all being controlled by a series of staged heat pumps, uh, water source heat pumps that are uh, doing simultaneous heating and cooling um, and then rejecting uh, energy uh, to the combined uh, chilled water system uh, that's split between these two buildings um, as part of a district loop. Uh, so we're actually able to offset some of the cooling um, and, and heating load of the adjacent uh, uh, building because of the district. Um, and then this is a project that we just, uh, I think we just finished design on it. Um, and this is actually a, a MLB medical office building. And it's gonna be one of the first medical office buildings in California that's gonna be net zero energy, including um, a battery backup system for resilience. Uh, so if you've worked in California, um, you've probably heard of OSHPOD. If you do hospitals, they govern all hospital permitting. Uh, so this is an OSHPOD level three uh, building, but it'll probably be the first one with a, uh, that's fully resilient. Um, I wanna say for one day backup uh, plus PV. Um, and so we're translating these systems. And I think this building uses VRF um, and, uh, and DOAS. Um, but we're translating these systems to all of our complex building types um, because it's a compelling story to be able to say, yes, I can do a hospital, I can do a complex research lab, I can do a medical office building. Um, so of course I can do your office, I can do your uh, multifamily building. 
Um, and then you start to see some of the really big projects, the projects at scale that are sort of the most exciting. And full disclosure, this is not a Smith Group project. This is a ZGF project uh, with AEI, I did the engineering. And this is the brand spanking new all electric central plant at Stanford University. Now clearly they have a few dollars to spend. It's probably the most gorgeous central plant I've ever seen in my life. Um, I would eat off the floors in the central plant. It was really nice. Um, but this project is, um, it uses heat recovery chillers, um, or heat recovery heat pump chillers, and a massive amount of thermal energy storage. Uh, so behind, behind this facade, what you don't see are the several million gallons um, sitting uh, just behind here of thermal energy storage, both on the hot water side and the chilled water side. So they're able to do, to manage their loads on their campus um, and do thermal energy storage, maintain the all electric uh, design. Um, and uh, it's just a phenomenal system, but that key is, um, adding enough thermal energy storage so that you can balance your loads uh, throughout the project. For us, that's the equivalent of what we would do if we could do ground source um, uh, geo exchange. And there are some projects in the in the Midwest that have actually looked at not just ground source um, heat exchange or, or geo exchange, but actually doing thermal energy storage below grade by doing uh, thermal boring with um, actually radiating your piles out to actually modulate the ground temperature for seasonal storage. Uh, which actually can be quite uh, cost competitive. It's like geo exchange was sort of enhanced uh, for more intentional temperature uh, gradients. Um, but the phenomenal project, but again, this is an entire campus, all electric. Um, and then so by definition, because our state electrical grid will be carbon neutral by 2045, this is their biggest step towards getting to carbon neutrality for their entire campus. Um, so one of the things that we see and a benefit that is actually, um, uh, it's almost a necessity here because of the, gr the grid layout that I showed you, um, was that thermal energy storage or battery storage, it's really the same thing, um, it, just a different form. Um, it, it, we use it because we are trying to do multiple things. We're trying to shave our peaks um, because it saves us, saves our client money from demand charges. We're obviously trying to um, be really efficient. So getting that um, heat recovery heat pumps and we can do, you know, get that enhanced COP if we're doing simultaneous heating and cooling. Um, but the biggest thing uh, that we're trying to do now is actually shift load. The newest utility tariffs came out for California and there is a huge whopping demand charge uh, for using power between four and 9 p.m. And that's precisely because of the graph I showed you earlier where all the uh, renewables are ramping down and demand while everyone goes home and turns on everything at their house goes up. We're having, our grid is having a challenge, um, especially in spring um, of that four to 9 p.m. period. And so the new tariff structure that just came out, it's a whopping uh, demand charge on using power then. So all of our clients now are like, are saying, how do I not use energy from four to 9 p.m.? which if you think about when do you see your peak load in the summertime, um, you know, this is driving huge dollar conversations. And for us, it means thermal energy storage, more so than battery for that particular use. Um, and by pushing load in, earlier in the day, we have lower outside air temperatures, our chiller and cooling tower are doing you know, more efficient work and, and store that chilled water so I can just turn everything off except my pumps uh, from four to 9 p.m. As I, as I run into my peak load. Um, that's a huge, a huge driver. And because of those uh, demand charges that are happening in the afternoon, it's actually making the financial case that thermal energy storage is just, oh, I mean, it was already cost effective, but now it's just a no brainer um, on our projects, especially at scale. Um, so I promised I would talk a little bit more about uh, domestic hot water. Um, and I saw a question pop up. Um, ah. Um, actually, that's a really good question. So um, these two projects were part of, um, so the question in the comment is um, of sharing water between the two buildings. Um, I, you know, am I sure it wasn't condenser water? So it's actually chilled water, but it's 55 degree chilled water. So both of these buildings actually, the predominant cooling um, is provided by 55 degree chilled water. And that's the, um, the central uh, modular utility plant that is for this whole little portion of the campus. Is actually designed around just providing 55 degree chilled water. We don't have a huge de dehumidification demand really ever um, in, in 
Northern California on, on the coast. And so we can, almost all of our cooling load is uh, sensible. At each building, they do have a little bit of dehumidification demand um, that's ex uh, sort of particular to the experiments that are happening. And so that's yeah. done with essentially a, a boost heat pump that takes the 55 degree water and bumps it down to the temperature yeah. that they made for um, chilled water. So it's not really a condenser water shared loop, although in most climate zones, that would make sense. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about uh, Damascot water because honestly, that is the, um, the biggest bang for your buck. Um, if you can do anything uh, to decarb your systems uh, in your projects, uh, multifamily Damascot water is just a huge chunk. When we look at the energy breakdown for a multifamily project, Damascot water, even in, in my climate zone, is you know 50% of the energy, total energy used by the building. In cold climates, it might be lower, it might be like 40% because you actually have a, a pretty decent space heating uh, requirement. But regardless of which climate zone you're in, domestic hot water is a huge load. So that's a big one if you're actually looking for decarb. So I went ahead and ran a couple scenarios just to give you an idea of um, how your choice of heat pump and your choice of source energy can dramatically change the other sort of tangential uh, impacts of, of your system. So as a case study, I'm gonna just say it's a 200 bedroom apartment building, multi-family, six stories, sort of run of the mill uh, apartment building, equally split between one and two bedrooms. When I run my ASPE calc uh, for peak water flow, the peak demand, um, I see about a 1400 gallon per hour uh, peak for three hours, that happens twice a day, morning and evening. And then my off peak is somewhere around 158, pretty low gallons per hour. Um, and so we're sizing air source heat pumps, um, you will never ever see a cost-effective solution that does not involve storage. You know, we have projects um, with gas-fired appliances, uh, uh, gas-fired condensing boiler. Um, even there, I actually have seen a project that was did like um, point not point of use water heater, but um, instantaneous quote unquote water heaters, no storage. Uh, but the gas line going to that building, I could have crawled through. It was it was amazing. But for every heat pump project you are going to match it with storage. The recovery, the ability for a heat pump to actually hit your peak load demand, if you actually size it for the heat pump to do it yourself, you'll, it will never be cost effective um, unless there's a radical change in cost structures around heat pump manufacturing. So it's always paired with storage. And what we've found is that cost effective sweet spot is typically um, meet, uh, making sure that our B2H available from our storage is about equal to what we can get from our heat pump. That tends to land out at a pretty cost-effective uh, solution on our, on our projects. Now, there's gonna be some regional differences uh, for sure. So I wanted to run one. So this is assuming um, air source heat pumps, um, big central, you know, good sized central air source heat pumps uh, paired with storage for this, you know, fake 200 unit building. Um, in order to heat hit my, uh, my capacity that I need for this particular project, I would need four of their biggest air source heat pumps uh, that this company makes. And I wanna point out something that's very, very important if you're looking at decarbonize, decarbonization and electrifying your buildings, and that's your connected load. Um, I typically can find space for heat pumps and storage in our projects, um, either in the parking garage uh, below grade, uh, actually, in a cold climate, it works out great because you've got that ground-coupled uh, heat, uh, heat exchange by default, uh, so it can temper the air temperature uh, really nicely. Um, but the bigger issue that we actually see is the increase on the load that your transformer is uh, going to see. And um, that is a big ticket item, um, especially in retrofits. Um, and so I just want to point out that when cold outside air temperature, even with storage, for these units, um, when I calculate out, I get a connected load of 176 kVA. Um, and that is really important because that can be the difference between um, a transformer that fits in a vault um, outside below grade and having to come above grade, at least in our urban context. Um, that connected load is probably the most restrictive uh, piece of sort of the domestic hot water uh, design component for our multifamily buildings. So it's something that we have to keep an eagle eye on. So this is Air source heat pump plus storage. And remember the air in the winter time is a, not a great source to pull energy from for heating hot water. So this is probably my most expensive option um, on the table. Try, and it's going to cost the most to run. 
you know, because that COP, when we see outside air temperatures fall into the teens, that COP is below two. Um, for us in our zone, uh, in our utility structures, I need to see a COP of three on average for the year to be cost competitive with natural gas. So if I'm pushing too many hours of the year um, uh, of the system into those nighttime hours, you're starting to run into a high cost um, component. One of the things you can do with this system though, if you want to, is add more storage, if you've got the space for it and you can stomach that cost, and you can lock out the heat pump production to only daytime hours. So if you have enough storage to coast through the evening and that first three hour sort of peak run, um, and then let your heat pumps run full on for 12 hours during the day, that's another option. You're gonna see increased outside air temperature, higher COP, higher thermal performance from your heat pumps. It's still a costly option. It's a lot of air source heat pump, it's a lot of storage. The next um, uh, section, um, uh, the next chunk is what if I go to the new heat pumps that are coming on the market? Um, and these specifically are CO2 heat pumps. So they're using CO2 as a refrigerant, um, R7, R R744, um, which is great because the refrigerant itself has a, a, a global warming potential of one. So even leakage isn't as big of a concern. Uh, but these operate at really high pressures. Uh, there's not a lot of choices on the market. There's a couple more coming on next month, which I'm super excited about. Um, the nice thing about CO2 heat pumps um, is that they are able to actually produce 180 to 197 uh, degree water, which is fantastic, especially for domestic hot water. And they're able to do that even at really low outside ambient air temps. Um, and you get a pretty good COP, um, even at those low temps. Um, and phenomenal COPs um, in sort of moderate outside air temperature. So in this particular example, to meet that same load, uh, because I can store water at a much higher temperature, I still distribute at the same temperature, but I can store water at a much higher temperature. <clears throat> um, I can go down to two uh, CO2 heat pumps to meet that same load, and then down to 1,500 gallons of storage. Um, so much smaller footprint, two heat pumps instead of four, um, and far less uh, actual storage on site. The really nice thing is that same solution, even though it's still an air source heat pump, it's dropping down my KVA uh, to 138. Um, so I've reduced that impact on my transformer sizing, which is really, really important because there's dollars in those transformers. Um, and if it's okay, I'll do one more slide and then we can take a break um, uh, because I wanna show this last example of why there's a ton of value in looking at all of your sources um, of energy. So this is the same scenario if I actually go to wastewater heat recovery heat pumps. So looking at my sewage water as a source uh, for your heat pump. So instead of um, uh, 138 kVA connected load using an air source heat pump, because the quality of that source energy is so good, I actually can go down to two smaller water source heat pumps that are designed for sewage heat exchange, and I can get my connected load down to 88 kVA. That's a huge reduction. It's almost 100 kVA less than what the air source heat pump um, option was. Now, the downside uh, with one of these systems is you need um, you still need all that hot water storage. It only makes 140 degree water, um, and you also need the below grade or parking garage grade um, sewage storage, uh, which tends to be around two to like between 1,500 and 2,500 gallons of sewage storage on site, which has an ick factor. You have to get over that with your clients. Um, but this is an example of finding the appropriate source of energy to actually both increase your performance, you get a COP of four, um, and also reduce your connected load, which is gonna bring down the electrical cost on that same system. Um, so with that, I'll take a pause, I'll breathe. <laughs> and then if we wanna have uh, a few questions uh, before I hop into the next section. <laughs> yeah, get some water, I guess. That was a pretty long uh, run there. Um, so there's a couple questions here on uh, electrical grid um, and conversions to there. I might hold off on those questions until the end of the next part, because um, I think you'll be hitting on a couple of those. Um, but obviously there's a lot of questions on the heat exchangers, so we'll kind of just run through here really quick. Um, so any issues with fouling on the wastewater heat exchangers that you yeah. should be concerned of? Absolutely. <laughs> so biologic uh, biofilm fouling on heat exchangers for wastewater heat pumps is actually the probably number one failure point for those systems. And there's a couple different strategies that different companies, there's a couple, there's a couple different companies in this, um, 
arena, if you will. Um, one of them actually uses um, a, a tube and shell heat exchanger with a mechanical device that actually scrapes the heat, the, the tubes um, in the heat exchanger. And it does that, you know, on some period. Um, and then others uh, use sort of a, a back flush, uh, you know, throughout the day, a back flush strategy to actually um, sort of wash off uh, the heat exchanger. But each company has a strategy uh, to deal with the heat exchanger because that's the, the, the biggest risk. You have a lot of biologic material that want, is looking to grow on something. And so they've taken a lot of the same strategies that wastewater treatment plants have used um, on their equipment uh, design and just applied it in smaller packaging. <clears throat> but it's definitely something to be concerned with because if you do get a, a robust biofilm develop on your heat exchanger, the COP just goes through, it just goes to crap, um, literally. <laughs> um, and then the, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the energy, actual energy production goes down as well. Uh, David Eldridge would call this the uh, sewer thermal HVAC system. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, question uh, from Joe Anderson. Uh, what type of heat exchangers are you using in these was uh, wastewater projects? Um, like I, so like I said, um, tube and shell um, tend to be the most foolproof um, because they can do the mechanical um, sort of clean, the mechanical wiping, uh, if you will. Uh, the key is, um, depending on the system, is what, how fine you're macerating the waste to and making sure that the heat exchanger is actually designed um, to accommodate less than great liquid flows. Um, so you can't do a super fine uh, heat exchanger um, and then expect to be pushing um, a sludge. I mean, it's not like a heavy sludge, it's still very liquidy, but you, it's not water. Um, and so uh, that's the big, and each company has a slightly different approach, um, whether it's uh, two and shell and I, the, um, without, yeah, without revealing manufacturers. Um, easy to say they're, they each have their own, um, but it's not a wild and crazy uh, system that's never been tested. Uh, the Vancouver Olympic Village um, is entirely heated and cooled uh, with a sewage heat exchange uh, heat pump system, uh, the entire Olympic Village and has since the Vancouver Olympics. Um, so that system has been running. Um, and then uh, one of the companies uh, that um, has the system, they have sort of the small uh, unit for like multifamily domestic hot water and then the, the large one, which is what we used at, at DC Water. Um, and that's actually going into the new, um, the new enormous Amazon campus um, uh, in Virginia. And so, um, they have them at very, the, both, com both of the companies that I know of and had a knife work with, both of them have systems that scale at like the urban scale and the building scale. Um, and the technology actually differs um, between the two based on the flow rates that you have to see. Um, Cause for these big urban scale projects, the flow rates are just kind of bonkers. All right, I'll give one more question. So from an existing building or existing structure standpoint, what are, what would be you look, what would you be looking for for these systems um, to be a good candidate? Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, one that um, I'm working uh, with uh, Peninsula Clean Energy here in, in San Francisco uh, to come up with a design guide specifically around retrofits. Uh, because to be honest, every new building should be net zero. Every new building should be um, really efficient. Like that's a no brainer. We should just be doing that. It's, it's actually, for us, it's cost competitive today. It's the retrofits that are really hard. Um, because you have limited infrastructure in place uh, that can take on new electrification yeah. systems, especially if they've been a mixed fuel building. So the first thing that we do uh, when we're looking at these systems, um, and I'll talk specifically around hot water is the first one. So around hot water, do I have a below grade basement <laughs> or parking garage? If I have access to um, a place where I can pick up the invert um, on the plumbing, then I would immediately jump towards uh, wastewater heat exchange for the domestic hot water production. And the reason why is because of that low connected load, that 88 kVA for this building, I might be able to pick up that 88 kVA through efficiency measures in the building of reducing other, you know, a lighting retrofit, um, you know, glazing impro improvements to reduce um, uh, AC load. I can probably pick that up through other efficiency measures and reducing the size of those systems so that I can have a net neutral impact on my electrical gear. Because I will tell you, 
that the biggest limitation for electrification and decarb work in a retrofit is my switch gear, is my transformer. It's what they built that building in 1964. It's, bare, it's not code compliant anymore. Um, so if I touch it, I have to fix it. So my goal is not to touch it. Um, if, I, if it's safe, if it's safe to use, my goal is not to increase my connected load. Um, and so we're usually uh, coupling a strategy like this where I'm adding more electrical load, I have to find somewhere else where I can pull it off. And that's usually with um, AC um, system reduction. So that's usually the, sort of that, the, that big load. Um, so that's incredibly important. Otherwise, it's a non-starter. Um, and, and we had a project, I had a multifamily project that was four stories downtown San Francisco, built in 1920. It had had a, you know, electrical upgrade in like 1950. Um, and still, it was like one outlet per room <laughs> in, in, the, in the apartment building. So it's, we, um, and that project didn't happen, specifically because we couldn't touch anything without having to upgrade everything. Elevators, egress, access, MEP. And so that that built until they actually have capital funds to do a gut rehab, that building will be what it is. Um, and and we did an exhaustive study of like, oh, where can I pull power out? It's like the service lo the service size on that building was so undersized that there wasn't anything I could do and still be code compliant, where an inspector wouldn't you know red flag me on day one. So yeah, all the strategies are really about what is your transformer capacity, what's your switch gear capacity. Don't touch it if you can. <laughs> so that's my big. Uh, call it whether it's domestic hot water or adding space heating now if you're already cooling your building you know for us in our climate zone if we're already cooling it we already have capacity for space heating it's a no-brainer but for your climate zone where your space heating actually may be the dominant load uh, depending on the building type that's a you'd have to do that analysis to see if adding that additional um, capacity is going to put you outside of your service or your switch gear service <clears throat> and i think that's a really great transition to the next topic Oh. Um, we do have a quick poll, so I'll let you take a little bit of, of a break. <laughs> um, that I'll go ahead and launch just so we can get an idea of who's in our audience. Um, give you guys a couple, um, maybe a minute or to vote. We do have about 95 people in attendance today. So thank you all for joining us. Wow. And step for drawing such a huge <laughs> crowd. This is awesome. I don't think I've ever had 90 people show up to hear me talk. So that's pretty impressive. It's probably because it's so cold outside for you guys. <laughs> Second it. Awesome. We actually can't open our doors because of the snow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, my, my brother was sending me uh, pictures from his balcony and on the South Loop and <laughs> I didn't want to be there. <laughs> yeah, you're lucky. That's where I am. And uh... <laughs> it looks pretty, looks pretty miserable. Um, yeah, so I've, um, so I've gone ahead and I've put some of the top, oh, actually. Oh, sorry. Yeah, do you want to pull it? Do you want to talk about the results? Um, just real quick. Well, so we've got 72% um, of us today are engineers. We've got a handful of vendors, um, a few contractors, and a few people on the owner, architect, utility, and other side. So nice. uh, pretty, pretty standard, but a big pull from the engineers. So thanks. Go engineers. Um, so I've pulled together sort of what's my top list of strategies when I'm looking at either new construction or, or retrofits, but mostly new construction, when I'm trying to look at a project for decarb or electrification. Um, and they aren't necessarily in order, but they're kind of in order. Um, the first one is, by all means, find ways to use heat recovery. Um, and ideally, not just a runaround loop. Because uh, the, the actual, well, in your climate, you guys would see more benefit than, than we do. But if we put a heat, heat um, a runaround loop on our exhaust air and our, our um, inlet air, our delta T's just aren't amazing. Um, and so the difference between our incoming air temp and what we're leaving the building isn't great enough for a runaround loop to provide um, you know, more than four months of benefit. The rest of the year, it's like, uh, that pumping energy might out actually outweigh the energy recovery. For you guys, it's probably actually a lot better. Um, but definitely think about using, um, especially the colder it is, think about using a heat pump as your heat recovery mechanism. So active heat recovery in lieu of uh, just a passive heat recovery uh, through runaround um, uh, uh, loops. We're typically trying to target, and this goes into your annual energy model, that, and, but it helps to keep it in your mind. 
for most areas, when we look at the cost of natural gas for a therm, you know, per therm, and the, um, how many cents a kilowatt hour a client is paying, when we actually do the convergence between the two, we're looking for a COP on our heat pump systems um, that average over three. If I can do that over the course of a year, um, then I can beat natural gas from a cost standpoint. And your client, that matters. Like, it, it, it is not a great solution to sell electrification and decarbonization if a client gets their bill and they're like, wait a minute, why did I do this? I'm paying more. So you have to focus on efficiency um, and not just the single sort of design case. What is the design day condition? But what is my annual performance? Going to electrification or heat pump systems, especially in a heating dominated climate, you're going to see more disparity between each month's cost. And so talk to your client about that. December, January 1, or in this case, February 16th, you're going to see a higher cost, but in the shoulder months, you're going to see a lot of savings. But the, the difference between those is going to be more extreme than what they've seen on their gas bill. And so you need to talk to them about that. You don't want anybody to be surprised, but at the end of the day, we're trying to save the client money. Um, if you can, design around mild supply water temperatures. If you're doing a hydronic system, you know, can you heat your building um, with 120 degree water instead of 180? I know it's crazy, you need different coils if you're doing an air system, um, but can you get away with uh, low entropy systems like radiant heating? You know, you can heat almost every climate zone with 120 degree uh, water or less with radiant systems, and you can do cooling with radiant as long as you deal with humidity at your DOAS system, um, you know, with 60 degree water. Those are amazing temperatures to make with a heat pump. Heat pumps love to make mild temperatures, especially when you have a good source energy. Your COPs are going to be just insane. Um, I definitely encourage every project to do a cost analysis around thermal energy storage. Um, you guys have more stable uh, demand charges than we do out here. But for us, TES or thermal energy storage is a huge asset to be able to shift our loads um, from one time of day to another. And more so, it gives our clients flexibility and reduces their long-term risk to utility demand charge changes. If I can design in a certain amount of thermal energy storage today, which say gives me six to eight hours of load shift, that gives our client a tremendous amount of flexibility of when they deploy that. And so if demand charges in five years change or 10 years, we can change the algorithm, change when we shift that load, and they don't have to do anything else, they can still save money. So looking at that long-term value and risk avoidance for our clients is exceptionally important. Um, when we can uh, reduce, or especially, uh, it matters a lot when we're looking at air source heat pumps because we can actually move the production to the good times of day with better air temperatures. And that's really important in cold climates. I do not wanna be using an air source heat pump at 2 a.m. or 4 a.m. in a cold climate. That's the worst time that I could use an air source heat pump add the thermal energy storage so I can run that during the day and coast through those night hours when our, my COP is gonna be you know, pretty bad. And the last thing um, I would add for sort of my rules of thumb in my head is really consider coupling decarbonization, electrification with more aggressive energy code standards. Um, so have you considered passive house um, as an, uh, uh, your energy standard for your project? And I say this, you know, a lot of folks are like, oh, passive house is so extreme. It's not, when you actually do the cost competitiveness and you reduce mechanical load costs, uh, it's not actually that extreme. But more importantly, by definition, passive house biases a reduction of heating specific heat load or your, your peak load on heating. And this is really important for cold climates when you're trying to uh, space heat with heat pumps. So if you can actually make your building that much more efficient, it gives you far more flexibility and load shift um, and it means that your building actual demand for heating is going to go down. So you can pay less on uh, buying those expensive heat pumps. And I'll talk a little bit about how that is impacting some of the work in, um, in, in Texas. Um, so speaking of uh, the grid going out, rolling brownouts, the world burning down around us, um, there's a lot of discussion around electrification and decarb and how it relates to resiliency. You know, I'm sure you guys have all seen in the papers, you know, California wildfires, our power grid turns off preemptively to not cause more wildfires because most of the wildfires are actually caused by utility lines um, being blown down in, in high wind events and then sparking and then burning the state down. Um, obviously, 
losing power is not great <laughs> when your building is all electric. It's not a great scenario. Um, and one of the big arguments that the sort of fossil fuel industry uses is like, well, if we stayed on natural gas, then everything would be fine. And to a certain extent, um, that's true. Uh, you would still have natural gas. But almost all of our mechanisms for utilizing natural gas rely on electricity, either for fans, pumps, uh, controls, whatever portions of the equipment are still electric that are uh, moving that energy around tend to still rely on electricity. And so the big discussion in California is I have a utility grid, electric grid, and I have a gas grid. Do I want to spend money to make both of those resilient? Or do I want to get rid of one of them and put all that money into one system and actually make it really resilient, like really resilient to fires, earthquakes, floods? I mean, we have it all. We have every disaster except tornadoes. We have it. Um, and so in general, the state is moving towards that. How can I harden one grid system instead of uh, uh, trying to do both? And for us, the natural gas story is not as resilient as it is for you guys. For us, after an earthquake, we don't have gas for two to three weeks. Uh, because after an earthquake, they shut it down because a lot of fires and earthquakes come from gas leaks. So they have to shut down the gas grid and we have to go building by building, um, turning gas back on. So it's this huge uh, task after a major earthquake here. Uh, so gas is not a reliable <laughs> source of energy um, for us either. Um, you know, maybe, um, uh, maybe more so for you guys. But all of this power shutoffs or loss of energy um, availability isn't, doesn't just impact when, we're, when the outage occurs. If you think about all the services that projects uh, may provide, like especially healthcare, um, they can't schedule anything until they know when power is going to be back on. And if you're unsure of when power is going on, you're losing both revenue from the outage and the scheduling impacts. And that's really important. And so the cost impact of loss of power, especially for all electric buildings, um, is, can be significant. So resilience is really important in how we plan those projects and how we design them and how we deploy them. At the same time, um, and this is true in almost every jurisdiction, energy, um, you can manipulate how expensive your energy is uh, by being really smart about when you use it. I mentioned that earlier with thermal energy storage. It's a huge asset for moving energy to off-peak hours. You know, for our clients out here, um, we see demand charges, especially in our sort of complex building types and uh, healthcare. Our demand charges can be upwards of 40% of a utility bill. And so this is the charge of when you use power, like literally how much power are you using in the, that one hour where they don't, they don't want you to. And that can be a huge chunk of the bill. So as we're working on a resiliency strategy, we're trying to figure out how can we add on uh, resilience to the project and reduce overall cost. Um, and so for us out here, you know, I mentioned we have a lot of solar energy. For us, solar energy is quite um, inexpensive. We, play, we pay probably $2 a watt installed. You guys, I think on the residential uh, side in the Midwest are more like $3 a watt installed, 308, maybe below that uh, for large commercial projects. But we see you know, sub $2 a watt um, on our large scale projects. We're also seeing battery prices come down to around 11 I don't know, $1,100 um, a kilowatt hour-ish, uh, which is a quarter of what it was three years ago. It's kind of insane. Um, as we're looking at all electric buildings, we have to look at resilience at the same time. Otherwise, you're going to end up with a really upset uh, customer or client if um, you convince them to do something, and then at the end of the day, they can't operate their building. So we're looking at taking uh, batteries, uh, which help us with those demand charges because it lets us shift load uh, to the time of day when it's least expensive, and then adding on to that renewable power. So it could be wind, it could be solar. We tend to buy a solar um, because it does two things. One, it helps us actually recharge the batteries at a lower cost uh, because it's self-generated. It's a higher utilization of power because I generate it on site. My losses, I'm not dealing with losses across the entire transmission grid, um, but I can still use the grid um, as needed to help balance out loads. So we're gung-ho on solar plus storage as a resiliency strategy for our all electric buildings. So why is this? The default answer uh, for building backup power is always a generator. It's a diesel generator, it's a gas generator, you're burning something, propane generator, you're burning something uh, for that, you know, three hours or those four hours 
where your building has lost power because the grid has gone down. Otherwise, that piece of equipment sits there and does nothing. Why? It's expensive. The fuel uh, and running a generator is typically, almost entirely, unless you're on an island off of Alaska, that generator is going to be far more expensive to run than purchasing power from the grid. But if the grid's not there, you've got your generator. The other issue with generators is maintenance and the uh, test run you have to do every month, uh, depending on your jurisdiction, uh, to make sure that it's up to snuff. And so when we're looking at battery and PV systems, we're actually trying to find a solution to avoid a generator if we can. Now, there's some cases where code requires us to have a generator for uh, hospitals for e-power. Uh, but can we do a resilient system that's self-generation, self-storage, that will save me money 99% of the year when I, when I still have access to the grid, but lets me manipulate my demand charges in a way that actually produces uh, or reduces my energy costs or can actually produce revenue? And then it's still there as a self-generation microgrid during an emergency. When the grid goes down, can I still perpetually operate? And how many days of resiliency uh, can I have? So we typically see this for us. So this is the map actually of the preemptive power shutoffs um, in uh, Northern California uh, just this year. Uh, so the yellow zones uh, were shut off of power um, for a couple of days. The red zones were actually upwards of a week uh, without power. You know, they notify us a couple of days ahead. They say, hey, a wind, big wind event is coming. We're turning off the grid. So it's kind of like the rolling brownouts, <clears throat> um, but everybody <laughs> um, and everybody's out of power. Well, that's a big deal. And there's, you know, wildfires are not going away in California. They're only getting worse. Um, and we could go into a whole thing of, of why that is. But um, the main thing is most clients now are jumping onto the uh, generator bandwagon. And that's producing a, a ton of cost. And it's also defeating sort of the emissions-free goal of electrification. If you have all these distributed generators with you know, marginal emissions, um, it's, that's way dirtier than actual grid power and definitely dirtier than what we could generate on site. And so, um, but you have to come to the table with a full financial analysis to say, well, can I provide you a better solution? Um, you know, I say, you know, when we're targeting, um, uh, resilience, we typically are looking for four, four to five days of resilient backup because that's typically what we're seeing when the grid goes down. If you're my parents, this isn't my, my dad, but um, this is a neighbor of theirs um, <clears throat> in Marshalltown, Iowa, middle of Iowa this summer, the Dreco wind event came in. My parents didn't have power for 12 days. Um, now, I will admit, I purchased a generator for them and had it shipped overnight <laughs> because um, I couldn't find anyone who could do battery solar in Marshalltown, Iowa, but we're working on the microgrid for them. Um, but 12 days is a really long time without power. And if that happened now, they would not be able to shelter in place. Their, the temperature in their home would fall so low, uh, they would not be able to shelter in place. They don't have a fireplace. They don't have any other means of uh, producing power. And their gas furnace doesn't work without power because uh, the fan goes out. So 12 days is a significant amount of time to not have power. So what we do, um, and this is, uh, it's not a proprietary software. We actually uh, use a program called Homer, uh, which was actually developed by NREL. Uh, it's the hourly optimization of multiple energy resources. It's a great program. I highly recommend it if you're interested in, in, in microgrids. Um, we'll take an annual energy profile. So this is every hour, energy demand every hour. We'll plug it in. And we can do full cost modeling for multiple energy assets. So we can put in wind power, solar, battery backup, cogen, generators, you name it, we can plug them in. We can plug them into a cost model <clears throat> and we can run out over 50 years if we want and look at both the best levelized cost of energy. If we take all the maintenance costs, the energy costs, procurement, capital costs, we can combine that all into a today, uh, today's levelized cost of energy. What would it take in today's dollars uh, to pay for kilowatt hour? <clears throat> We can model that. We can add in unexpected outages or expected outages of any duration, and we can randomize when they occur throughout the year. So for cold climates, we could bias the colder months because that's you're going to have lower sun exposure for hour, you know, number of hours of sun exposure and a higher heating demand. So we can bias when the year we want to put these sort of random outages in and find what is the most cost-effective all-electric 
carbon-free option. You don't have to be carbon-free. Oftentimes in certain climates, a generator actually is cost-effective paired with battery and solar or standalone depending on your utility costs. We can fold all that in and actually do full lifecycle cost modeling for these renewable microgrids. Um, so this is one that I actually ran, um, I don't know, about a month ago uh, for a healthcare client. They're building a new administration building. And that uh, administration building was effectively uh, going to be their center of operations in the event of a power outage plus pandemic. Had to keep it running. And they asked us to keep it running. Um, well, to find a sweet spot, but they wanted at least three days uh, because for their region, that's the typical outage. So we ran all the scenarios. Uh, this particular client um, already benefits from wholesale power. So they can buy power. They're, large, they're a large enough entity and they have their own substation. Uh, so they can already purchase power at 11 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, which puts renewables at a huge disadvantage because that's a really low cost for California. Most California uh, commercial clients pay 16 to 17 cents a kilowatt hour uh, for their power. And so already buying wholesale, they're already at advantage. But what we were able to do is actually put in their energy loads. Uh, we did a whole series of resilient scenarios. How many days outage do you want to prepare for? And <clears throat> the sweet spot for them actually came out to about four days of, of backup. And remember, it's not that your battery is sized to just operate for four days because you've got on-site generation, whether that's, in this case, it was PV, but you could actually pair that with a generator, generator as well. <clears throat> um, but PV helps charge the batteries during the day. And, and weather is in here. You can analyze for cloudy weather, et cetera. Um, we can take all of that into account. But for them, combining a, a 393 uh, kilowatt PV system plus a 216 kilowatt hour battery backup system um, actually provided with, for them a totalized levelized cost of energy over the life of the project with all battery replacements, maintenance, everything at below 10 cents a kilowatt hour. So we could actually beat grid cost power and provide continuous operations with um, an on-site generation, on-site storage. And this is really important we have to be able to be honest with numbers. Um, it's, we can't just go into a project and say, hey, this is what you should do because trust me, I know what I'm doing. Uh, we wanna be able to provide that cost model. And this cost model was actually updated in partnership with our contractor who actually provided the battery costs and PV costs. So these were not the numbers that I have in my head of what batteries should cost or what PV should cost. These were actual um, hard quotes uh, that I got at several price points so I could develop a cost curve for both batteries per kilowatt hour and uh, PV per installed uh, kilowatt per installed cost. Um, so at four days of resilience, um, which actually could be five, depending on the weather and events, it actually could stretch out longer, but targeting four days, I could provide them not only net zero energy on site you know, or purchased over the course of the year, they actually ended up being net positive energy and it's still priced out. So this project, they decided not to do any of this, which I was like, oh no. Instead, they want us to look at their entire campus can we do a resilient microgrid for their entire healthcare campus? Uh, so um, just took the scale and it's gonna go bonkers big. Um, but that's what you're up against. Um, they wanna electrify their campus, but they also wanna have resilience against wildfires, pandemics, uh, smoke inhalation, all, all sorts of stuff, but to do it at a lower cost of operations uh, than they do today. So that's, I think, I think that's everything on my mind. Um, but the big message is we can't just talk about electrification or decarb. We have to do it holistically and look at resilience as well. Um, and if folks have questions about what's going on in Texas right now, I'm happy to chime in on that um, as well because I have uh, lots of folks I know down there um, on the utility grid side. All right. We got a lot here. Maybe we just create a podcast. That'll probably be the, the best medium here. <laughs> um, well, first, just, I mean, I'm sure people will start falling off here. Um, actually, it's still 86 people. This is fantastic. So I definitely think there's a there's a strong interest in this topic. So I think uh, that gives us, at least Asher, Illinois, some guidance on some future discussions. Um, so it's great. Um, before you, if, if people start falling off here, um, thank you, Seth, for a lot. That was really yeah. amazing, thoughtful. Um, with some great research in there. So we do have some questions here. Um, there's some themes going on. So I might truncate some of these a little bit. So we'll get to Texas in a second, but there is the initial kind of, I guess, elephant in the room, the natural gas utilities and some of the challenges. And so I guess the question, we'll try to be diplomatic here. What are some of the challenges that you've faced, at least in California, 
sure. um, at least from your experience. And is there a middle ground, I guess? I don't know. I guess I'm, I don't put you in a corner here, but obviously yeah. there's that we want to address that question. Yeah. So a bunch of challenges um, in California. So um, most of the utilities um, in California, with the exception of one, are what we call um, mixed fuel service providers. So Pacific Gas and Electric sells gas and electricity. They have fully endorsed going all electric. Why? Because they foresee having to maintain the gas infrastructure that is crumbling um, and incurring that cost. And they don't want to. <laughs> so actually PG&E, um, San Diego Power, all the folks that are dual fuel providers on the utility side have actually fully endorsed going all electric. Like they have put their in, in industrial weight behind it. The, uh, there is a company in Southern California, which I won't name, but they're the only gas provider that's not electric provider. They are, obviously this is a threat to their uh, in, entire uh, business model. Um, and so one, they've done a huge lobbying effort to convince people that you can't eat food unless you have gas. Um, and I, I have a separate uh, talk that I've given on electrification of commercial kitchens. Um, but that's, they're, they're throwing the culinary you know, Restaurant Owners Association at, uh, at us and um, a number of the cities have been sued. Um, on the opposite side of that are all the tech companies that are all building all electric commercial kitchens and commissaries. <laughs> so it's totally doable. We're doing a bunch of them. So it's actually not hard. We can do it cost competitively. You can operate the kitchen cost competitively. Um, so it's it's kind of, it's more of a marketing uh, campaign. That being said, I don't think any of us are trying to um, throw anybody under the bus in terms of um, losing jobs. Um, and so a huge uh, part of electrification and decarb work here in California and in Washington State is actually focused on uh, market transformation and jobs training. Um, so. When we started working on the code changes, and I helped write the code in San Francisco, San Jose, and Berkeley, so I've been like in the mix with writing the code language, we actually got all the trade unions in the room with us. Um, and so uh, a big help was actually working with like the pipe fitters uh, union um, and other trade groups and manufacturing uh, companies to say, hey, here's where we want to be. Here's where we are he now. What barriers are there for you to get where we would like to go? And for the pipe fitters, honestly, it was including language around requiring, um, you know, at least in San Francisco, gray water systems, which we should be using anyway. <laughs> like we should, we have no water in California. We should be by default using gray water systems to reduce that load. And they said, you know what? If we can find a way to translate our union jobs into another task that also supports the environmental mission, we are happy to support it. But we just don't want to look have a net loss of jobs. Um, and so that was a big, big deal uh, for us was actually partnering with industry and the trade unions instead of just saying, look, we want to do this and screw you all because uh, that doesn't work. And that's a horrible uh, scenario. So that was one of the strategies that we did in, for San Francisco um, and San Jose is actually working with the trade groups. At the same time, all of uh, uh, we're, uh, there's a big push in um, for uh, all the heat water, uh, heat pump, hot water retrofits, that that's a huge market. And California is doing two things simultaneously. One, they're doing a bunch of job training uh, for the um, for uh, trade partners in, in the building industry, like, um, you know, uh, construction, um, plumbing and electric, uh, electrical unions on what does it take to do a heat pump retrofit uh, for, for single family homes. Uh, that is a huge market, and it's key to the state actually hitting their goals. And so they're doing a job, a huge job training, um, coupled with a massive incentive structure to pay homeowners to do it. And so they're creating the demand and um, partnering with uh, the unions on job training. And so that's actually a, a huge win. The city of Sacramento will give you fifteen hundred dollars to swap out your water heater, and and the, and they've got a backlog. Um, so. Uh, people are into it, and uh, there's tons of jobs in that in that retrofit market. Uh, some pretty compelling. Uh, must be nice, and I, I just feel like I think some of us here in Chicago have low apprehension with you know dealing with some of the very entrenched <laughs> uh, it stakeholders. Is, and so, I mean, when we first started this, there was a lot. Um, I got a lot of words. 
<laughs> shared with me <laughs> that I won't share with you. Um, but at the end of the day, you have to listen. <clears throat> like people want to work and people don't want to lose their jobs and they don't want to lose their livelihood. So it is about finding what is the pathway to get us there. I think mm -hmm. the other important thing to know is that we're not losing gas tomorrow. We're, we're on a 25 year quest to get our economy to carbon um, uh, neutrality. And so there are still plenty of opportunities to take those low performing buildings and at least get them to efficient gas systems um, as they march on their way, you know, because you're going to replace systems twice by the time, you know, 2045 is around. And so, um, you know, getting That's people on the way. At. Yeah. <clears throat> so kind of going on along that. So there's also the question of grid capacity, right? Mm -hmm. So going to electrification, yeah. strain on the grid. Um, Luke had a question <laughs> on, you know, putting electric cars and parking them and that infrastructure that's associated with it. And I don't know if that can also piggyback of maybe some of the things that we're seeing in Texas. I honestly, and so yeah. kind, of, kind of building on that. So it may give us some of uh, your insight. Yeah. That. Uh, so so it's, that's obviously a huge issue. Is the grid, wherever you are, ready for this much load shifting onto it? <clears throat> and if I said yes, without any asterisks or caveats, I'd be lying to my teeth. Um, so in California, the grid is not ready for us to be all electric, um, but we're right now focused on new construction, at least making sure the buildings, and we certainly have capacity for the new construction because we're building in capacity every day. The real struggle is when we go actually go and want to look at retrofits. And I'm on a bunch of sort of the state committees looking at like, how do we effectively do retrofits when we can't build enough capacity in the grid? And there's a couple things that we're um, sort of all talking about, and most of it is around demand load management. Um, so when do you charge that car? Uh, when do you uh, run your AC? Um, are you doing any on-site storage? There's a big movement right now <clears throat> out here is um, having cars be bi-directional charging, um, which um, there's only a couple manufacturers that can do. Um, in which case your battery is, or your car is a battery for your building and vice versa. So it can actually help you manage load when it's just sitting there and you're not driving around. The big, uh, the big issue is if we actually electrified all of our transportation. Our buildings, we actually think we, could, we can manage it because buildings are actually far easier to, um, to match load. We can, we can do, you know, there's a huge history of DR, res, you know, response, uh, demand response. Uh, systems, load shifting, load shedding, turning, you know, dimming lights. There's a there's an industry around that. People like to charge their cars when it's convenient. And California has the highest number of EVs per capita in, in anywhere. And I, you know, I live 30 minutes from Tesla's headquarters in Fremont. So um, there's Teslas everywhere. Um, but people like to plug in <clears throat> uh, when they get home. And that's not when we want you to charge. 5 p.m. is the worst time you could possibly <laughs> charge your car. And so a lot of the work is actually working with the manufacturers to do um, time delayed charging. Um, and so rather than looking at like what happens when you put all the load on the grid at the same time, we're actually looking at how can we distribute that load more evenly and predictably. So the grid doesn't have to respond at a crazy rate um, and instead is much more uniform um, and paired with what we call the time of renewables, time of low carbon power. Um, so why don't you charge at work? instead of charging at home you know in the middle of the day we've got ton we've got excess power in the middle of the day because we have so much solar on our grid for you guys in in, in uh, northern illinois nighttime would be just a beautiful time to charge you've got this big fat nuclear base load that's just humming along whether you need it or not that's zero carbon power so you guys should be charging you should be doing whatever you can to push power at night like don't use any power during the day load shift and tes all night um, would be phenomenal for your carbon footprint. In Texas, there's a couple things happening. Um, <clears throat> one, the uh, Texas building code still allows electric resistance heat. Ooh, when it gets cold out, <laughs> uh, you do not want your heating demand to increase linearly with the outside temperature falling. <laughs> like that is a bad combination uh, to look at peak load. Whereas if you if they use heat pumps, they just throw on some mini splits. Then you know a COP of say two, you've at least dampened your electrical demand for each temperature change increment outside. <clears throat> and that would be huge. And mini splits, you can, I, I swear you can buy a mini split at like Home Depot for $1,500. Like they're not, they're not bonkers expensive. So 
that's one issue is their code still allows you to use electric resistance heat. The second one is a, an actual issue around resilience and source energy. <clears throat> For the wind generation, which I, I have a, a graph, I didn't show it to you guys, but uh, Texas is about equally distributed between uh, gas generation, wind generation, and coal. They're about equal um, sort of chunks of the pie. So they actually get almost 26 of their percent of their power uh, from wind power. But unlike any other climate zone <laughs> Uh, in the country that has wide use of wind, they don't have any de-icing equipment. Uh, so you can you can get a wind turbine with leading edge de-icing. They use it in Iowa, they use it in Minnesota, they use it in Sweden, um, where the, the blade is actually has a heated leading edge. <clears throat> uh, it's a, a thermal edge. Um, and it prevents ice buildup. So the issue on a wind turbine blade is when you get ice buildup on that leading edge, you lose the aerodynamic efficiency of the blade. And so production all, already drops. They also don't have heated gearboxes and heated equipment inside the nacelle. And that's like driving you know, a diesel car to Minnesota in the winter and being like shocked it won't start in the morning. It's like any, any Minnesotan knows you gotta have an uh, engine block heater. You know, you gotta keep the engine warm. It's not gonna start. So. Um, that's the same thing. It was like, there is technology available that could make this work. They just didn't install it. And there's about a 5% upcharge on the cost of a wind turbine to go with appropriate winterized conditions. And so that's a, that's a cost value. I would argue that if there's a chance you might see ice, hit the, you know, buy the good stuff. Um, but that was a cost value decision. The other piece, um, so they have two things going on. They lost generation and they increased demand. And two of, and both of those are actually totally fixable um, if you buy the good stuff. Um, but you know, we historically pick equipment based on historical weather data. And all of you guys know that 30 years of historical weather data is crap for predicting these extreme events uh, that we're seeing, whether it's a Chicago heat wave, whether it's a San Francisco heat wave. We saw 104 you know, degrees outside last year. Our design temperature here is like 87. <laughs> Like, like none of our buildings could keep up. So that's the other piece is actually, well, we need to change how we're thinking about selecting equipment and it's not based on historical uh, TMY3 data. <clears throat> that's gonna get us in trouble. But the same thing for on the generation side, if we actually coupled the right technology in the region for the extreme events that they could see, they could have, out, they could have run right through this. If they hadn't used electric resistance heat on you know 30% of their homes, uh, the demand wouldn't be spiking like it is uh, in this uh, winter event. <clears throat> and then the other piece is with all renewable energy, we need to think about storage. Grid size renewable storage um, with batteries is absolutely re required to even out that supply and actually let the uh, grid operators manage the grid. Without storage, there's too much fluctuation and you're gonna have more, more rolling brownouts. All right. Um, still 70 people here, so I think uh, we can <laughs> have a couple more questions here. Um, I'm going to focus on the grid part. Um, I know we have a couple sure. questions here going back to the, the wastewater heat exchanger. Um, so, uh, Luke has actually had a question that I also wanted to ask. Um, should we start discussing the way we op um, should we start discussing like operating carbon, right? Um, looking at the embodied carbon of the MAP equipment that I also was kind of thinking of this when you with the heat exchanging systems um you had the uh the vapor injection system right so the refrigerant obviously in there and I'm guessing it's not the good kind of refrigerant um <laughs> so in that kind of sense like when we're talking about these things I mean we need to be mindful of how do you I guess in your head how are you balancing greenhouse gases versus carbon and where do we kind of have to think about carbon? Yeah, this is great. You guys are asking all the things I get like super jazzed about. So, um, so thank you. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this is really big. We, um, when we've been working on our net zero energy buildings and I, I think I've probably done, I don't know, maybe 25 or maybe more than that net zero energy buildings um, by now. And we're all, we are like patting ourselves on the back. Oh man, we've solved the world. <clears throat> well, in a whole bunch of these, you know, we've got these VRF systems that are just pumping refrigerant through, you know, a whole building. We've got more refrigerant lines running through these things um, than you can count. And the industry as a whole underreports leakage, refrigerant leakage. Um, so I've uh, been trying to work with a couple of the local design build 
uh, service contractors in the area to get a better sense of, um, you know, what are your recharge rates? How often are you going back to recharge these systems? You know, is it annually? Is it every three years? Is it every five years? And it's wild all over the map based on install quality. And so we do fundamentally believe that refrigerant leakage and the global warming potential of those refrigerants is actually a much bigger deal uh, than the industry as a whole, ASHRAE as a whole has acknowledged. And it's even more important when we're talking about net zero energy buildings where I'm effectively op offsetting my operating energy with renewables, carbon free. So now I've taken that operating carbon pie and made it either zero or very, very small. So now everything else from a carbon standpoint is huge, whether it's the global warming potential of leakage or whether it's the embodied carbon of the equipment that I'm picking um, or the systems that I'm picking. And so there's a couple of things that um, uh, on a lot of my projects that I'm sort of pushing. <clears throat> One, it's gonna be crazy, but I love a good hydronic system. Oh, a good four pipe hydronic system. Just, mm, it's so good for so many reasons. And I'll tell you why. One is my heat pump is self-contained. It is factory sealed. It has been tested. It has been pressure tested. It has been leak tested somewhere in a beautiful, beautiful factory. And so the risk for refrigerant leakage from a monoblock, air to water, water to water, whatever heat pump is far less. It's been pressure tested. It, it's a more robust installation. And so if I have a water leak somewhere, it's a nuisance, but I can tell it's there. If I have a refrigerant leakage and I'm running refrigerant piping through my entire building, I don't know where it is. I have a really hard time finding where it is. It doesn't leave a little, you know, wet spot in the toilet room above the sink. Like, where is it? I don't know. And trying to find it is really hard. And if it's a pin, a little pinpoint, slow leak, good luck. So that's going to just be like recharge, recharge, recharge. And meanwhile, leaking uh, refrigerant out. And so I'm a big fan of um, hydronic systems with a monoblock or all contained heat pump. And it also gives me the ability to do thermal energy storage, which I just told you is really important on a renewable grid or a net zero energy building is to be able to manage that load so I can reduce my heat pump size. Um, I can optimize that, that size and I can rely on the thermal energy storage to give me that um, sort of variability that I need in, in demand charges. <clears throat> so I would say it's a huge issue if we don't fix it. Um, and especially when on net zero energy buildings. Now I will say there is some good embodied carbon in some mechanical systems. And I say that um, sort of really emphatically that I still, and we've done a little bit of analysis to show that we can do a high mass radiant system for heating and cooling um, with a good air source heat pump doing mild temperatures. And I can make up for that embodied carbon of the high mass slab uh, by being that much more efficient. Uh, because a high mass slab, I can actually change when I run that, when I charge that slab with chilled water, you know, at 60 degrees or warm water at 90, I can actually do that at any point in a 24 hour cycle and to meet the load in a building in almost every climate zone in the United States. The way that we design uh, mass radiant systems ignores the fact that the mass has thermal mass and we can load shift like nobody's business with those. Um, and research out of the Center for the Built Environment at UC Berkeley has actually shown that, and in a field study shown that, that we can shift up to almost 24 hours when we actually apply the load and still meet uh, uh, space temp. And so there's some, there's some embodied carbon that I would say is actually more beneficial than other embodied carbon. Um, coupling ceiling fans with a DOAS system and truncating how far out the, the duct goes. Like if you're doing large spaces, cut the ducts throw in some ceiling fans, you actually have lower embodied carbon, but you'll still get really good mixing. Um, so those are some of the things that we start to balance when we're looking at our mechanical systems to reduce, increase efficiency, but also reduce sort of the embodied carbon um, uh, or uh, uh, sort of uh, fugitive emissions that in involve carbon. All right. Well, we're coming on the two hour mark here and I actually have Selfishly, I have another meeting actually. So, <laughs> in the That's, time of COVID, yeah, we all have our our four hundredth Zoom call for the day. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Um, well, Seth, thank you so much for all of this. Um, there are some questions in here. I might shoot them your way, and maybe yeah. we can send yeah, them out to the individuals as to ask the questions. Yeah, no problem. Um, a lot of great information here, so we definitely appreciate it. Um, the webinar will be on the website. 
Um, so that I think with your permission, we'll you know share the slide deck. Maybe if you need to take out some stuff that is a uh, proprietary, definitely. I don't think anything is secret. So perfect. Yeah, we'll share that with Not you. Not anymore, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just don't post my address to the gas industry. <laughs> 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 I already have it. <laughs> oh. So thank you again. Thank you for everyone who joined us, stayed with us for the last two hours, um, and uh, look out for uh, more content from us. Uh, actually, Liz, any closing remarks? Nope. If you guys could just take a second to fill out the survey when you close out of Zoom, that would be great. Um, and Sagar and Seth both, it was awesome. So thank you so much. I feel like you definitely kept people engaged the entire time. So. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And shout Everyone. out, shout out to our, um, to Cindy and Nancy and Victor and all our folks in our Chicago office um, and Luke at SOM. He's also on a bunch of committees with me. So um, yeah, shout out to all my decarb friends in the Midwest. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Well, thanks everyone. Have a good night and stay warm.